But I think you mean next spring. Next spring. No. April. <laughs> uh, we'll be Rick, Rick Moody. So Rick Moody will be our, our Vermont fellow for, a uh, visiting fellow for next uh, spring. But, so that's a little bit of the history and a little bit of the future. But last summer, to celebrate the 50th anniversary 
of the International Journal of Literature, Politics, and Culture, Salomon Gundy, an exhibit at the Tang Art Museum at Skidmore College paired visual artworks with excerpts of various written pieces from the journal's pages from over its years. The name of the exhibit and its subsequent catalog was Afflict the Comfortable. The title took its name from an often used definition of one of the rules of art, meaning it serves either to comfort the afflicted or afflict the comfortable. Now, while that typically references a dynamic between those in power versus those who are victimized by the power structure, it also can be and has been applied to a more personal, introspective level as well. When I think of Claire Massoud's work, particularly of her latest novel, The Woman Upstairs, my first thought lands on the notion of afflicting the comfortable. And by that, I mean that through her protagonist, Nora Elridge, Claire Massoud is not afraid to challenge our perception of cultural acceptability. In fact, she is bold enough to give us a character who breaks our conventions of polite gentility of comfort, a role that Nora herself has played with some level of success. Meanwhile, her, uh, her true sense of self, one that often contradicts the accepted norm, remains hidden and private. Only by the time we reach the end of the novel do we realize that all along, Nora has been making an argument, a polemic for eventually, through the storyline of the novel, becoming at peace with an attitude and worldview that is contrary to the conventional sense of etiquette that the culture has judged <coughs> as is Claire Massoud's novel afflicting the comfortable because she's suggesting something outside of the norm? Needling at some of our deepest fears or secret less thans? And now my own contradiction. If through her book, Claire is calling out some of our deepest fears and less thans, then is she in a way also providing comfort? Just as Nora ultimately wants to be seen for who she is, as opposed to feeling invisible or forgotten, doesn't the, novel, doesn't the novel that brings out what we think are our own secret flaws or quirks actually provide comfort by making us feel a little less alone? Last week, I sat in this very room with at least 25 women from ages 18 and up as they discussed the, women, the woman upstairs. And while opinions and interpretations and analyses vary, one underlying trait was shared by most, compassion. Like Nora or don't like her, root for her or feel frustrated by her. It is difficult not to feel compassion for her. And that, I suspect, is something to take comfort in. Please welcome Claire. Oh, yes. Can I give you a little hug? Thank you. Such a beautiful introduction. Thank you. What a gift to be so generously read. Thank you, Adam, and thank you all for being here. I, um, I, I'm leaving it this as though I needed to, but I don't, because I have a thing here, right? So, so that, there's nothing there. <laughs> um, but, but it's wonderful to be here, and I, I've just had uh, the most marvelous visit, and uh, the, the seminar yesterday with such tremendous young writers it was really a, a gift, and, um, and it's great to be with you all this evening. I also went to Newport for the first time in my life today, which sort of, um, you know, you hear about it your whole life, and I don't live very far away. I thought I didn't need to see it because I could imagine what it was like, but that wasn't true. That wasn't true. Um, Bristol is also very beautiful. Um, a more livable scale, I believe. Um, so, so I thought this evening to read a little from, uh, from the woman upstairs. I hesitated because because it's now been a little while, so I, and I've been working on something else, and I, I had the moment of thinking, should I read to you from the thing I'm working on? And then I thought, no, I'm not brave enough, so, so I'm not. So, <laughs> so I'm reading you from, from, uh, from Nora's story. Uh, and, and then if, if anybody has questions, I think we'll have time for that afterwards. So, uh, so uh, a, a little background. Nora Eldridge, uh, the narrator of this novel, is is a school teacher in uh, elementary school teacher in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, the the I, I feel she gets a little 
she's had something of, well, insofar as she has any public life, she's had something of a bad rap because people say she's angry. Um, to which I have several responses. One of them, aren't we all? Um, <laughs> at some point or other, isn't everybody angry sometime? Uh, but, but I would say that, that, that there are events that, that you hear about at the end of the novel that are fairly, have transpired fairly recently when she's ranting at the beginning of the novel. But that for most of the novels, she's not angry. Um, the, the, the rant came to me like a, a, a voice, um, you know, a voice in my ear, and I wrote it down, and then I had to figure out who was, who was ranting. So that, that's how I met Nora Eldridge, was she, she had a go. Um, and, and I thought I would start by reading just the first uh, couple of pages, um, with apologies for the swear words. How angry am I? You don't want to know. Nobody wants to know about that. I'm a good girl, I'm a nice girl, I'm a straight A, straight laced, good daughter, good career girl, and I never stole anybody's boyfriend, and I never ran out on a girlfriend, and I put up with my parents' shit and my brother's shit, and I'm not a girl anyhow, I'm over 40 fucking years old, and I'm good at my job, and I'm great with kids, and I held my mother's hand when she died, after four years of holding her hand while she was dying. And I speak to my father every day on the telephone, every day, mind you, and what kind of weather do you have on your side of the river, because here it's pretty gray and a bit muggy too. It was supposed to say great artist on my tombstone, but if I died right now, it would say such a good teacher, daughter, friend instead. And what I really want to shout and want in big letters on that grave too is fuck you all. Don't all women feel the same? The only difference is how much we know we feel it, how in touch we are with our fury. We're all furies except the ones who are too damn foolish. And my worry now is that we're brainwashing them from the cradle. And in the end, even the ones who are smart will be too damn foolish. What do I mean? I mean the second graders at Appleton Elementary, sometimes the first graders even, and by the time they get to my classroom, to the third grade, they're well and truly gone. They're full of Lady Gaga and Katy Perry and French manicures and cute outfits, and they care how their hair looks in the third grade. They care more about their hair or their shoes than about galaxies or caterpillars or hieroglyphics. How did all that revolutionary talk of the 70s land us in a place where being female means playing dumb and looking good? Even worse on your tombstone than dutiful daughter is looked good, Everyone used to know that, but we're lost in a world of appearances now. That's why I'm so angry, really, not because of all the chores and all the making nice and all the duty of being a woman, or rather of being me, because maybe these are the burdens of being human. Really, I'm angry because I've tried so hard to get out of the hall of mirrors, this sham and pretend of the world, or of my world, on the east coast of the United States of America in the first decade of the 21st century. And behind every mirror is another fucking mirror. And down every corridor is another corridor. And the fun house isn't fun anymore, and it isn't even funny. But there doesn't seem to be a door marked exit. At the fair each summer when I was a kid, we visited the fun house with its creepy, grinning plaster face two stories high. You walked in through its mouth, between its giant teeth, along its hot pink tongue. Just from that face, you should have known. It was supposed to be a lark, but it was terrifying. The floors buckled or they lurched from side to side and the walls were crooked and the rooms were painted to confuse perspective. Lights flashed, horns blared in the narrow vibrating hallways lined with fattening mirrors and elongating mirrors and inside out, upside down mirrors. Sometimes the ceiling fell or the floor rose or both happened at once and I thought I'd be squashed like a bug. The fun house was scarier by far than the haunted house, not least because I was supposed to enjoy it. I just wanted to find the way out. But the doors marked exit, led only to further crazy rooms, to endless moving corridors. There was one route through the fun house, relentless to the very end. I finally come to understand that life itself is the fun house. All you want is that door marked exit, the escape to a place where real life will be, and you can never find it. No, let me correct that. In recent years, there was a door, there were doors, and I took them, and I believed in them, and I believed for a stretch that I'd managed to get out into reality. And God, the bliss and terror of that, the intensity of that, it felt so different. Until I suddenly realized I'd been stuck in the fun house all along. I'd been tricked. The door marked exit hadn't been an exit at all. I'm not crazy. Angry, yes, crazy, no. My name is Nora Marie Eldridge and I'm 42 years old, which is a lot more like middle age than 40 or even 41. Neither old nor young, I'm neither fat nor thin, tall nor short, blonde nor brunette, neither pretty nor plain. 
quite nice looking in some moments, I think is the consensus, rather like the heroines of Harlequin romances read in quantity in my youth. I'm neither married nor divorced, but single, what they used to call a spinster, but don't anymore because it implies that you're dried up and none of us wants to be that. Until last summer, I taught third grade at Appleton Elementary School in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and maybe I'll go back and do it again. I just don't know. Maybe instead I'll set the world on fire. I just might. Be advised that in spite of my foul mouth, I don't swear in front of the children, except once or twice when a rogue shit has emerged, but only sotto voce and only an extremist. If you're thinking, how can such an angry person possibly teach young children, let me assure you that every one of us is capable of rage and that some of us are prone to it but that in order to be a good teacher, you must have a modicum of self-control, which I do. I have more than a modicum. I was brought up that way. Second, I'm not an underground woman harboring resentment for my miseries against the whole world. Or rather, it's not that I'm not in some sense an underground woman, aren't we all, who have to cede and swerve and step aside, unacknowledged and unadmired and unthanked? Numerous in our 20s and 30s were positively legion in our 40s and 50s, but the world should understand, if the world gave a shit, that women like us are not underground. No Ralph Ellison basement full of light bulbs for us. No Dostoevskian metaphorical subterra. We're always upstairs. We're not the mad women in the attic. They get lots of play one way or another. We're the quiet woman at the end of the third floor hallway whose trash is always tidy, who smiles brightly in the stairwell with a cheerful greeting, and who, from behind closed doors, never makes a sound. In our lives of quiet desperation, the woman upstairs is who we are with or without a goddamn tabby or a pesky lolloping Labrador, and not a soul registers that we are furious. We're completely invisible. I thought it wasn't <coughs> true or not true of me, but I've learned I am no different at all. The question now is how to work it, how to use that invisibility to make it burn. Um, so, so, um, that sort of is the beginning and, and, and the end, sort of. I mean, that's, that's where it will end. I mean, that's how she's feeling at the end. Um, <laughs> she, um, she, the story is mostly about a year in her life when the family uh, comes to Cambridge. There's a, a little boy in her class, uh, and she meets his uh, parents. First, she's, she, she's in the classroom. His name is Reza. And she meets his parents, Sirena and Skandar, who have come from Paris, but, but the mother is Italian and the father is Lebanese. And, uh, and they're there on a fellowship. The husband has a fellowship. And, um, and it, it turns out that, that Sirena is an artist. And, and this matters because what Nora uh, always wanted to do when she grew up was be an artist. Um, and she makes art in her spare time, in her spare room. Uh, she, says, she says in the novel, I wanted two things. I wanted to make art and have children, and, and I do have children, but they go home at the end of the day, and I do make art, but it's, you know, I make it in the spare room at the weekend. Um, but Serena comes to town and offers to share a studio with her, and, and there begins for Nora a sort of charmed and wonderful year in which uh, all sorts of things that seemed impossible suddenly seem possible. Uh, and then it, it gets complicated. I um, we were talking today uh, in class, you know, one, one of the things um, that I wanted to write about was uh, specifically Nora's, but a, a person's interior life. Um, so much of what, I think so much of what matters, that's something that, that just always interests me. It, it, it is true, I think, in any book, the epigraph to the, to the last book, The Emperor's Children, um, is from uh, Anthony Pohl, and it's, it's not what happens, it's what we think happens that matters. Um, and, and it seems to me that our, our, our experiences are so um, ultimately private. Uh, you know, I was telling somebody the other day, in college I, had a, I, I, I briefly had a boyfriend who I liked very much, and there was an evening, I, I, didn't, I didn't love him or anything, but I liked him very much, there was an evening where we had a long conversation until 2 in the morning, and then I called him the next day, and I said, should we go to that movie after all? And he said, but we broke up last night. <laughs> and I said, did we? I didn't, I didn't realize. Um, <laughs> it just hadn't occurred to me that there was all this talk about, you're so European. I was like, what are you talking about? But it didn't occur to me, he was saying, I'm breaking up with you. Anyway. <laughs> That's, um, but there are many examples uh, of that where, you know, where, um, 
where we, each of us has a, a, a different experience. And, and so much of what, what matters most doesn't break the surface. And, and, and I mentioned this, um, I guess, yesterday, but, uh, but, but I'll mention another one, too. I don't know how many of you remember in, um, in, in Anna Karenina, when uh, Levin's brother uh, comes to stay, the, the judge comes to stay, and then, and then um, Kitty's friend, is she called Varvara? Um, who's, who's, who's sort of essentially a governess, is, is visiting also, and they have a sort of flirtation. And everybody thinks that he's going to propose and they're going to get married. And, and in fact, they both think that. And then they go off, um, they go off to pick mushrooms in the forest. And with great expectation, everybody's sure this is the day, this is the moment. And then she, they have some banal exchange about the mushrooms, like, do you know what kind this one is? And she answers, I think it's the such and so. And then the moment passes. And they both know the moment has passed. And they both know he will never ask. And that they will never get married. And then they go back and join everybody else. And life goes on. A and it's this, it's this, it's this almost this sort of crescendo and diminuendo of music that never breaks the surface. Nobody ever said anything, and nobody really knows why. Um, but there's also in uh, the the other uh, example that I was citing yesterday is in Chekhov's uh, *Lady with the Little Dog*, uh, which some of you may know, where Gurov is a middle-aged man who's who's married with a family and has had a number of affairs, and he goes to Yalta and has an affair with a the lady with the little dog who's never. Uh, had an affair before, but she's also married, and then they part company, and he goes back to Moscow, but he can't stop thinking about her, and eventually they resume the affair. But there's a moment where he's taking uh, his child to school, and he thinks to himself, how can it be that the thing that is most important to me in my whole life, nobody else knows about? And then he has a second thought, which is, this is true for everyone. And, um, and I think, you know, that is, that is something that that I'm always, well, not always, how would you get anything done? But I'm, I'm, I'm intermittently and often aware of is, is how little we know. And I wanted to tell a story of, um, of, of, of what it was like inside Nora's head. Um, all the things that don't break the surface, all the things she doesn't say, um, except to the reader of the book. Um, but now I will read a little bit um, of her history about her childhood. And then, and then we, can, we can chat, if you'd like. From the beginning then, but briefly, I was born into an ordinary family in a town an hour up the coast from Boston called Manchester by the sea. The 60s were barely a ripple there at the end of the Boston commuter line. It must have been our perfect beach, called Singing Beach on account of its fine, pale, musical sand, but perhaps also because it is so widely and so long lauded, that afforded me my delusions of grandeur. It makes sense that if you stand almost daily in the middle of a perfect crescent of shore with a vista open to eternity, you'll conceive of possibility differently from someone raised in a wooded valley or among the canyons of a big city. I feel like you guys have that advantage here. Um, or maybe, more likely, they came from my mother, fierce and strange and doomed. I had a mother and a father, a big brother, eight years bigger than me, though, so we hardly seemed of the same family. By the time I was nine, he was gone and a tortoiseshell cat zipper and a mangy runty mutt from the shelter named Sputnik who looked like a wig of rags on sticks. His legs were so scrawny we marveled they didn't snap. My father worked in insurance in Boston. He took the train each morning, the 752, and he proceeded very respectably but apparently not very successfully because my parents never seemed to have money to spare. My mother stayed at home and smoked cigarettes and hatched schemes. For a while she tested cookbook recipes for a publisher. She was paid for it. And for months, she fed us elaborate three- and four-course meals that involved eggy sauces and frequently, as I recall, Marsala wine. <laughs> Briefly and humiliatingly for me, she fancied herself a clothes designer and spent several months at the sewing machine in the spare room in a swoon of tobacco smoke. Her output was at once unusual and not unusual enough. She made paisley, paisley jersey mini dresses for girls of my size, not at first glance dissimilar to those off the rack, but then you'd see she'd cut portholes around the midriff and edged them with rickrack so that a girl's white tummy would peer through. Or that she'd made the sleeves so they attached not with seams but with a flurry of ribbons, a circle of multicolored bows that would look bedraggled after a single washing. Cheerfully impractical, she ran up at least two dozen outfits of various designs the summer I was nine 
and then took a booth from which to flog them at the fair in a neighboring town. My mother, unlike my father, instilled in me the sense that unpredictability was essential. Not to be like your neighbor, that is everything, she would say. And because of this, because of the bright flame of her, it took me a long time to realize that she, too, was cautious and bourgeois, frightened of the unknown, and so uncertain of herself that she could hardly bear to make a mark. How else could she have stayed resolutely wedded to the ordinary, to my father, to the carefully ordained and unchanging routines of Manchester by the sea? And it explains much about me, too, about the limits of my experience, about the fact that the person I am in my head is so far from the person I am in the world. Nobody would know me from my own description of myself, which is why, when called upon, rarely I grant to provide an account, I tailor it, I adapt. I try to provide an outline that can, in some way, correlate to the outline that people understand me to have, that I suppose I actually have at this point. But who I am in my head, very few people really get to see that. Almost none. It's the most precious gift I can give to bring her out of hiding. Maybe I've learned it's a mistake to reveal her at all. So from our ordinary family in our ordinary house, a center entrance colonial with its potted geraniums on the stone porch and its charmingly untended yew hedges nibbling at the windows, I made my way out into the ordinary world to the local elementary school, the local middle school, the local high school. I was popular enough universally liked by the girls, even liked when noticed by the boys, though not in a romantic way. I was funny. Ha ha, not peculiar. It was a modest currency, like pennies. Pedestrian, somewhat laborious, but a currency nonetheless. I was funny in public, most often at my own expense. Education was different then, and I was good at it, and so I skipped grade nine, went straight from eight to ten, which was socially a little tough at first, and sealed my fate as a disastrous math student. I never learned the quadratic formula and other important tips from ninth grade math just like I missed the early dating essays and the classes in how to navigate a school dance. At the time, though, I wasn't embarrassed about any of this, not embarrassed to be thrown sink or swim into the second year of high school without so much as a map to the cafeteria or a primer on how cliques were lined up, or even a list of the names of my new classmates, all of whom knew one another and some of whom knew me as their little sister's friend. No, I was proud because I knew my parents were proud because it was an elevation and a revelation of the fact that I was special. I'd long suspected it, and now I knew for sure I was destined. When you're a girl, you never let on that you're proud or that you know you're better at history or biology or French than the girl who sits beside you and is 18 months older. Instead, you gush about how good she is at putting on nail polish or at talking to boys, and you roll your eyes at the vaunted difficulty of the history, biology, French test and say, oh my god, it's going to be such a disaster. I am so scared. And you put yourself down whenever you can so that people won't feel threatened by you, so they'll like you because you wouldn't want them to know that in your heart you are proud and maybe even haughty and are riven by thoughts the revelation of which would show everyone how deeply not nice you are. You learn a whole other polite way of speaking to the people who mustn't see you clearly and you know you get told by others that they think you're really sweet and you feel a thrill of triumph. Yes, I'm good at history, biology, French, and I'm good at this too. It doesn't ever occur to you as you fashion your mask so carefully that it will grow into your skin and graft itself, come to seem irremovable. When you look at the boy, Josh, who skipped the grade alongside you, and you see him wiping his nose upon his sleeve, and note his physical scrawniness, his chin's bloom of acne next to the other 10th grade boys with broader chests and clear square jaws, when you observe that he still takes his lunch with his old 9th grade friends, all of them boys in black t-shirts with glittered decals across the breast that say KISS or ACDC, all of them with pimply chins and wet lips and hair as lank as seaweed, you cannot see any triumph in him at all. He seems clearly to have lost, to be lost, to be a loser. Because anybody knows that in the challenge you were given when you skipped a grade, social success, modest social success to be sure, but still, was half the battle. When Frederica Beatty invites you to join her birthday party, a sail on her father's boat with six other girls, two of whom are from the most popular set, you feel pity for Josh, who will never taste such nectar. But wait, nobody ever pointed out that Josh, in his obliviousness, was utterly happy. He'd already taught himself the quadratic formula. He would not be stymied in any area of academic advancement. In fact, he would go on to MIT and eventually become a neurobiologist with a lab largely funded by the NIH and a vast budget at his disposal. <laughs> He would marry a perfectly attractive, if rather knock-kneed woman, and spawn several knock-kneed, bespectacled nerds, replicas of himself. 
it will all work out more than fine for him and he will never for a second suspect that it could have been otherwise. He will not know there was a social test. He will not know that he failed it. No, a sail on Frederick Abiti's father's boat was an honor that he dreamed not of. And his yen for society, such as it was, was perfectly satisfied by his old clan now a year behind him. He could no more have fashioned a mask than flown to the moon. And so he remained who he was forevermore. Femininity as masquerade, indeed. I'll stop there. Thank you. And I'm happy to, to try to answer, try any questions anybody might have. Yes, sir. She, uh, you're, you're here and reminds me in part of, uh, of I'm thinking of the, one of your early books that was two shorter stories mm -hmm. together with somebody that lived downstairs and, <laughs> and, and a woman who took care of somebody who went to Cuba and bought oh, all kinds of outrageous art. Right, that was, the, that was, they were, they were not, yes, they, they were two stories. One was about the woman, the housekeeper, and the other was about the, um, yes, the person in London. Right, there was something about that housekeeper especially breaking out of what the expectations, the social expectations were. So I, I really like this, I mean, I see it a similar feeling to it, even though they're apart by what, by 15 years or something? Or? I, in the writing? Yeah, yeah, yeah prob probably close. Yeah, certainly 10. Yeah. No, 12. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A, lot, a lot apart. Yeah. I mean, yeah. but, but I like that same sort of feeling because it's not, um, it, it enables, I guess, the reader to think through his or her expectations and how we fight those and kind of break out of it, you know? Or I, I just like heroes like that. They're kind of ordinary and yet they're not, you know, they're not like, like super heroes. There, there's something really- Well, thanks. I mean, thank you. Yeah. I, I, I think um, each, you know, each of us at so many moments makes choices, the consequences of which we don't, uh, we, d we can't ever know, we, ca we can't, there was a lovely, where was it, with my brain, where was it, about the lives that, you know, that the, the, it was a poem about the lives that might have been, um, and I can't remember where I was reading, but, but I think that sense of, um, of, of the, you know, I thought through for Nora a, a series of choices that led her to this place and 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 uh, you know she's a school teacher it's something that she uh, loves to do and feels uh, she loves the kids but but it's also true that it satisfies some some other sense of a, a sort of should a sense that she should be doing good for other people um, that she shouldn't be living entirely for herself um, that that I think in her case, you know, people sometimes say, well, is she just a bad artist? Why isn't she an artist? Is she that she doesn't have talent or this? And I, and I feel as though there's so many, in my mind at least, in, in, in the case of Nora, there's so many issues in play, partly temperament, partly circumstance, partly familial background and so on. Um, and part of it is this, is just a sort of um, un unquestioned set of preconceptions, uh, among them the idea that, you know, you can't, um, that, that just sitting in your room, you know, I remember I used to love reading in bed more than anything. And there was, um, I mean, I still do. Like, I, I, I read happiest, most happily this way. And, and um, there was one, so I, I used to wake up early on the weekends and, and lie in bed reading. And there was, um, there was one day my mother, I sort of finally came down at, you know, 11 o'clock in the morning and my mother said, oh, you woke up? And I said, no, no, I've been awake for hours. And my mother lost a rag and she said, you mean I've been tiptoeing around the house and you could have been out of bed four hours ago? Right? And, and all of a sudden I was, you know, ever thereafter I felt guilty about lying in bed reading because, because I was supposed to sort of show myself and, you know, empty the dishwasher or something. Um, and I, so I think in that sense everybody, you know, each of us makes, makes decisions to, to make the space that we can within the framework that we we're given. I don't know. I was like, uh, yes, ma'am. So when you talked about the rant and the rage at the beginning that was in your mind and became your story, I guess, how, how does that differ? How is that different from a secret kind of life that 
we all play roles. You know, we have our professional role, and, and we put on that when we leave home. And then there's maybe the budding artist or um, a, a woman wanting to break out of a marriage or, or whatever. How is the secret different than the roles we play? Is that courage that, that, or is that cowardness? Is it, well, I mean, to, to have to stay in, within our role, like, right. and, and not try, not be the artist. Right. Well, I think that's, I, I, I don't have the answer. I think I wanted to raise the question. Is that the, the source of part of the rage, though, that, that she hasn't taken the chance? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. I, I mean, I think, um, I think for each, I, I remember being at a talk um, years ago I, that Naomi Wolf gave. If you see who she is, it's a feminist of my uh, generation. And she's a very great sort of motivational speaker, very inspiring. And it was, this was at the Edinburgh Festival in the UK. I was living there at the time. And she, she said, we all had amazing dreams as kids, didn't we? What did you want to be? And like somebody would go out with the mic and like, I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to be. And she'd say, why aren't you? Why aren't you an astronaut? Um, not that many people get to be astronauts. Like they dismantled the space program, I guess. <laughs> now virtually nobody gets to be an astronaut. But, but, but I think there, there's the, the, the voices of our culture are very contradictory and paradoxical. And I think on the one hand, there's some idea that we should, which is a, a very sort of specific uh, uh, 20th century, late capitalist, North American and, and European idea that we should realize ourselves, that we need somehow to be true to, to an authentic, that there is some authentic self to which we must be true. I, feel like I, I think in many cultures that's not a, uh, they're just saying how can we get some dinner? They're not really, they don't have the luxury of asking what is my authentic self? But we're also given a whole. We're also given a whole lot of of, of other, um, uh, often unquestioned uh, preconceptions about what is right, what is good, what is appropriate, what is moral, and so on. And I think to to try to it is like trying to square a circle to 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 to, to answer to both of both of those uh, very different voices. I I don't know that. W one trumps, one should trump the other. I mean, I think there's individual circumstances where obviously one should trump the other. Like, should I continue reading my novel or save the drowning child? I feel like, well, <laughs> it just seems kind of a no-brainer. Um, but, 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 I, but, I um, but I think there are, you know, there are times where it's really uh, open to, to question. And even in something like leaving a marriage, you know, there are circumstances where is that, is that the, is that going to be a, a realization of self? Is that the authentic gesture, or or would ultimately the authentic gesture be? To depends on the situation, but might it in some situations be to stay and work harder at it? I don't know, you know. Why didn't she? Um, why didn't she develop her art, her artistic side? I mean, she was she was single. She had no responsibilities. Uh, she taught school, but. School's great, you know, it's like nine to five, no Saturdays and Sundays, she get all those holidays off. Um, I think there's some school teachers. <laughs> some school teachers are, are, are your rest of school teachers in the, yeah, in the I know, but she's room. she's been teaching third grade for how many years now? She hasn't been teaching for that long, and, and, and you, you may not remember that her mother died not that long ago, and that she spent her, right. she spent much of her 30s um, taking care of her. I think, is it four or is it two and a half? Uh, four. Yeah, you know, see, you remember better than I. But 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 certainly, like, here's the thing that four years from forty-two. Yeah, that's thirty-eight. I mean, she had some right, adult but, time. Sure, but she but but she. Of course, she had some time. I, I'm not I'm not trying to like make a defense. Like, oh my God, she had no time. Um, but I, but I think um, have you, have you done everything you wanted to do? Because. I know I haven't tidied my TV room in six months, having having woken up like every Friday morning, thinking, and when I get home today, I gotta tidy that up. Just hasn't happened. I mean, I think I think there are a lot of things, but also, 
um, the, in, when I um, when I had I had children in my 30s, so uh, at 34 and 37, and 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 before I had kids, I was young. It was great. I was young, and and I would teach class, and at the end of class, um, the the students would say, "Should we go for a drink?" Um, and you know, you'd hang out and have a good time, and then I, you know, I had a, a baby, and I was busy, and then I had another baby, and I was busy, and for a while I wasn't teaching, and then I went back to teaching, and. I didn't really feel that I was that different, but there was a moment at the end of the class when the student said, well, night. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized, oh, I, I'm, not, I'm not young anymore. And I, and I think um, there, the, that that's something that's happened for her is, is some sense that she was deferring possibility and, um, and that then suddenly it doesn't feel possible, which doesn't mean it isn't possible, right? It's not what happens, it's what you think happens that matters. Um, and the thing about the year, the thing about the year with Serena is that suddenly it all feels possible again, but 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 it's attached, misguidedly, her therapist might say if she had one, it's attached to those people so that when they go, she thinks that possibility is leaving with them, which is again, um, I, I think a lot of us at various times uh, invest other people, whether in our families or or elsewhere, with po more power. When I met my mother-in-law for the first time, having heard what a terrifying creature she was and how, how much my husband-to-be feared her judgment. And then this woman appeared who was like five foot two and, and, and seemed perfectly sweet. I was totally mystified. I was like, really? That's the scary person? But, um, but, but to him, she, she remained terrifying um, always. So it's, it, you know, I think um, what you, you invest people with power that, that they don't objectively <coughs> necessarily have. And then you think things are possible or not possible because of the stories in your head. I, there are people who are amazingly unblocked and fill a day with a thousand things. It's incredible. But not many people are unblocked. Most of us are blocked somehow, I think. So. I got a question. She, she was greatly affected by taking care of her mother through her long illness. And I, I'm not, not quite sure whether she resented that or that gave her a feeling of purpose. Where was her father during the illness? She never mentioned whether he took any part in helping out with the mother. Right. But he didn't, he, he, she didn't seem to resent that she was the one who was doing it. And what was the, what, what was the Right, what was the feeling? Is it not possible to both be, find it gives you a sense of purpose and somewhat to resent it? Isn't it possible for both of those things to be true? And her, I, it's, Right, that, that I think you, you can feel um, this, is, this is the most important thing I can, like I should save that drowning child. I'm gonna get up and save that drowning child. And, and, but I was at a really good place in my book and I'm kind of bummed that I have to leave it. I mean, you can, I think it's possible to feel both, both things, you know, to, and, and, and certainly in my mind that the, the, her father was present and, um, and, and certainly part of taking care of her mom, but, but it's, it's a big, it's a big job. I, oh, you know, I, know that. I don't know if, if, if any of you saw the, that film Amour that, um, that got so much attention um, by Hanukkah, is that his name? Is that who made it? That it's, but it's about an aging couple where, where the, the, the woman gets quite ill and the husband, she stays home and I mean, she's home and bedridden and the, and the husband's taking care of her. And all the reviews said, you know, amazing, but it's so harsh, it's so dark. And I had just come through taking care of my parents and, uh, you know, through their uh, final illnesses. And I thought, no, 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 no. This is way, makes it look way too easy. Like, you know, I'm sorry, but, 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 but that, you know, she, she's going to have to have, pardon me, a diaper change like numerous times a day here. And that doesn't seem to feature in the film. Is he doing that? Is he lifting her up? And it didn't come into it. You know, I mean, I think there's plenty, when somebody is elderly and not well, or, uh, or as a baby, I mean, either way, uh, when somebody needs really full-on care, there's enough to go around for, for dad and daughter both. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. This may be a little bit, I don't know, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, I am one of those teachers, and I was made very uncomfortable by the steps that she took with Re Re Reza. Mm-hmm. I mean babysitting for him, you know, moving, you know, practically moving into the, to their house, I mean, 
make us a move into their house? Well, it, it seemed like their lives were so intertwined, it was like almost like they were a family. And I found that so icky as a teacher. I mean, it really <laughs> skewed me out. Right, right, you know, right. And any school district that they found, you know, like, they would, they would be like very sure. Sure, but it is but it is something that happens. I you know I was talking about this earlier with Adam. Um, routinely, when our kids were small, we didn't ever. Um, but the kindergarten nursery and kindergarten teachers routinely babysat for the kids. By third grade, it doesn't happen much anymore. But routinely, not Did for our kids. Cambridge? Yeah. Oh, all right, that's better. <laughs> oh, that explains it. <laughs> sorry. In the real world, it's a, I'm sorry. I mean, it was it was it was absolutely. Because I, huh? I was like, Ugh. I mean, I really was. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> and who wants to take care of kids after we go home? I, I understand that. that. You didn't believe it. No, I didn't. I was like, for real? No. No, it can happen. No, I didn't buy that. Well, it's good to know you don't love them enough to take care of them. Yes, ma'am. Not at night. Well, I, th I think um, I think that, I was, that, that I, I was questioning that because it seemed unlikely. It seemed unlikely that she would lose them. Yes, and then I was wondering maybe I'm missing something more important. Well, I think people do things accidentally on purpose. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the the the. Oh, I, I broke it accidentally. I'm so sorry. But, oh. You know, but I, I mean, things these things happen, and, and I think the the the. In my mind, the, what it would mean to her for the gifts to be meaningful is, is so, it means so much for her that they be meaningful, that if they're not meaningful, if they're just things that were in the house that he was getting rid of, then she can't bear it. So it's actually better for her not to know. Then it becomes something she can imagine rather than something that she has to... But um, uh, uh, when she loses it, though, um, she um, uh, goes back to the um, uh, copy of place to uh, some find out if um, uh, somebody found the bag. So um, uh, obviously she wanted to know what was in the bag. Well, just, it's like, it's like the thing, um, was she resentful to take care of her mother or pleased to do it? Both things can be true. I think a lot of the time we have ambivalent feelings and, and on the one hand sh it, it's unbearable I mean there's a um, there's a really interesting book that I read last summer by an author with an Irish name it's not going to help you woman called it's all in your head I think and she's a neurologist and it's about actually um, this complicated notion of holistic disease Right, so, so she, she treats a number of people who have seizures. There's no question, they have seizures. I, I have seizures, so I'm, I'll have to look it up. Well, but you may, you may well have organic causes for the seizures. What's interesting about, she, I mean, she treats those patients also, people with, you know, that were the, were the, but they can trace through your brain waves whether your brain is actually having a, a as it were, is forced into a seizure or whether there's no change in the brain waves. Yeah. And, and, and she's looking at patients who have no change in the brain waves. They're experiencing seizures, but, but you cannot find an organic cause for it. And, and, and in those cases, she, um, she follows some, sometimes she finds an answer and sometimes she doesn't. But, but there are often people who are, um, who ha there's a trigger of some trauma that they actually cannot acknowledge or confront, that they may not even know they may not even have a conscious memory of the trauma. Is that a defense mechanism too? Your, your brain just doesn't want to do it because it's going to hurt you so much? Or something like that. I don't, I mean, I'm not a scientist, so, but yes, I mean, I think that's sort of what she's saying. So uh, I, I tell the story just to say that there are, that, that, that our, our brains are very complicated. Yeah. And there are things that we cannot allow ourselves to know. Well, that some part of our brain is protecting us from knowing right. in, and might, do, might protect us in very dramatic ways. They never found out what I'm called mine. Oh dear. 
I'm sorry. Well, no, I'm used to a, 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 I don't know what causes mine. I'm a, whether it's of a lack of sleep or whatever. I'm a, so I'm a, a, but I'm a, I mean, I'm, a, I'm used to them when I'm not used to have them. But I've been on medication all my life. Does the medication help? Yes, it does. Well, see, that's, that's another thing, is that if there isn't an organic cause, the medication doesn't, it, it doesn't does, help. It does help to control them. Yeah, so, yeah. That's good. Yes, sir. She never seemed to give herself credit for being a good teacher. I couldn't figure, I couldn't figure that out because I, I was a teacher and then a guidance counselor. And I, the, the one thing she never seemed to say, I, I'm really good as a teacher. And she, I, don't, I, couldn't figure I don't think she spent, says she's very good at much, though. Pardon? I don't think she spends time thinking she's good at much, though. Well, yeah, I, you're right about that. And I couldn't figure that out. Yeah, I, I, guess, I guess that was her way. She knows she gets yeah. kids. Yeah. But she does know that she gets kids. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but she doesn't think that that's a, gr a great thing, which is a tremendous thing. Right. It's a and, good girl. And she yeah. never really felt that that was something that she, she was accomplishing. I guess she wants to be an artist. You're saying it's a good girl thing. It's a good girl thing. Being a I'm sorry to the teachers. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good girl thing, I mean, to be a teacher. That was what a girl was supposed to do then. You know, those were one of the professions that was open to her. You know, that was the good girl. That's and true. she was the good girl, but also the safe girl. Right. Because if she did her art and set it out, she was putting herself completely in front of people. And that's a hard thing to do. Hard thing to do. But I thought she did say that she's a good teacher and that she gets kids, but those people who end up being principals act like they get kids, but they don't really get kids. The kids, ones who really get kids are the ones who are the teacher like herself. You seem to... Right, she that does have that. Herself. She does have that. Yeah. Excuse me, yes ma'am. How did you get to the type of writing that you do as opposed to non-fiction, um, making a choice for a story to be more about you, putting yourself out there, and choosing your characters to be fiction? As a right. Why? Well, how did you develop and, and decide this way? I th I think it it was almost um, it was a choice I made so early that it wasn't even conscious. I was I I I was I was that annoying kid who who from the moment I realized that the stories that I got read at bedtime were made up. I thought yeah, you can do that. That's the thing you can do. I want to do that. Um, so I. I remember I worked briefly um, after university. I worked briefly as a—I mean, I, I, I've done a, a lot of freelance journalism over the years, but I worked briefly at a newspaper um, in London. And 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 I—it seemed like you could, the, the, you know, the, you know, there are all those journalists like um, James uh, Fry. Right? Is that his name? Yeah. Who we were talking about earlier? There are a whole lot of them who just make junk up, like just totally. I was listening on NPR just the other day to. There's a there's a, a, a whole uh, series of of suppose uh, it was an article in, in Science magazine about about uh, about surveys done door to door about people's opinions about LGBT and then and then and then they were just made up and 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 in fact he he'd made up incredible little anecdotes about the people he'd supposedly interviewed when he hadn't really interviewed anybody. <laughs> And I have to say, I, that makes total sense to me. It's why I shouldn't be a journalist, because I feel like, you need some data? Make it up, right? Like, you know, why not? It's so much more interesting. Make it up. So it seems, it seems just a matter of, of ethics, almost, that I have to stick to the yeah, fiction side. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So again, I think you know both things are are, are perhaps true, right? I, I feel like there's you know she's she's maybe I, I mean is she gay? I don't know, I, I, but I feel like she certainly feels something that is that seems in its intensity more than a 
uh, more than friendship, right? But she she sort of feels that about the husband too. So let, well, I, I, the, she's certainly bisexual. I feel like I, I don't know, I don't know what um, like the, a young woman told me she was pansexual. I was like, huh? I don't. I, what does that mean? I feel like that's it. What are all the choices? I don't know what all the choices are. Certainly, let's say she's bisexual, right? <laughs> um, and um, <laughs> that got a rustle going. I'm like, <laughs> like, what is that? Um, let's discuss. Let's discuss pansexuality next two hours. Um, the, um, <laughs> we'll be here for some time. Anyway, um, but I think it is also true that, uh, you know, the, th the thing that, that, that I'm, um, that, that love, love that, that friendship is desire, right? It isn't sexual desire, but it's desire. You, you, you rarely, f you rarely, you know when you, you meet somebody and you think, oh, I want to be friends with her, um, and it's rarely because you think they're dull, hideous, stupid, and mean, right? It's, it's, because, it's because there's something that you find um, attractive and possibly enviable, right? That you think, oh, she knows so much about art history, or, you know, oh, she's such a great dancer, or like, whatever it is. Um, and, and, and so there is that element, too. I think that, that, that she, is in, she is in love with that, their life, like their whole life seems to her enviable, I think. Yeah. It's so interesting. <laughs> the, well, it seems glamorous to her. That's part of it, right? Which, you know, doesn't make them good people. Yes, ma'am. Well, I think it, it, it always has to be some version of the latter, right? Because you can't imagine what you can't imagine, right? What you can imagine is limited by who you are. Mm -hmm. So there are, things I, there are things I can't imagine. Like, I don't think, you know, there, there are novels that Joyce Carol Oates has written that I feel like that's, she has an imagination that can go places my imagination cannot. You know, do you remember she wrote that novel about the serial killer? Jeffrey Dahmer, I feel like I, I couldn't imagine, I couldn't, I don't think I could imagine myself there. Um, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't put my head into, I couldn't put my mind into his head. I don't think I could do that. Each of us has a different, so, so and, and, our, and, and the parameters of what we can imagine are some combination of temperament and experience. Um, so in that sense, um, in that sense, you know, but I, do, but I, I think it isn't, there's not, I, I'm trying to think if there's anything in any of my books that's strictly autobiographical. I feel like places, I, 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 I often, sometimes places are imaginary, but sometimes places are actual. So when you build a character, are you building it? Little bits, little bits. You know, I was, I was saying to the students earlier, there's a, a character, called Dee Dee, who's a, a, a friend of Nora's, um, who was based in my mind on the friend of a friend of mine who I didn't really know very well and only know a little bit better now. But, but I, I projected all sorts of things. I had a whole sense of, this is, what, this is what this person's like. And I felt free to, her name is not Dee Dee. I felt free to kind of, she has a different job. She's you know, different in lots of ways. But I felt free to kind of imagine her. Um, and as I've got to know her better, I find she's not at all the person that I that I imagined her to be. <laughs> but but it's you know I, I had a um, the writer Colin Toybean once said you can make up the story or you can make up the people but you can't make up both. Which I find you know I, I spend a lot of time thinking is that true is that true Adam is that true maybe it's true I don't know I don't know but it but it's I, I think what he was saying is you have to be grounded somewhere and may, and maybe that's true. Um, you know, the, uh, it, can, it, it, it is that magpie thing. It's little different pieces. I mean, partly the interior life thing I wanted to write about, partly um, women and art I wanted to write about, um, partly, uh, well, also, uh, partly uh, 
the, the idea that you, you know, people, I was saying this to the class earlier, that, that as we sometimes take, uh, we pin a complex story on, on little evidence. That what it is to live inside your head is to have a lot more freedom to, um, and the example I was giving is, you know, you, you might at university have an interaction with somebody and think, oh, he definitely fancies me. Yeah, yeah, he said, like, he's waiting for me to come to the party, you know, and then you come home and tell your roommate and what happened, and she says, no, that doesn't mean he likes you at all, <laughs> right? I mean, that, 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 that there's, some, there's some way in which we can sometimes, on the strength of, of very few, um, very little concrete evidence, we can make a whole story in our heads. So I wanted, I, I wanted to write about that. So there were lots of different elements. Yeah. Do, do you think Serena knew Skanda was going to the studio to meet Nora that day when she wasn't there? That first time? I don't know. What do you think? I don't think so. Because I'm a, 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 she ever thought it might be Emma Serena, but Serena wouldn't have ever had the key to get in. That's right. That's right. But, but she thought, but he thought that Serena would be there. He messed up because he thought Serena would be there. He didn't come there on purpose the first time. I mean, he didn't come on purpose to see Nora the first time, as I recall. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes ma'am. You mentioned earlier that Nora disappointed you. You heard her talk and everything. I've heard other authors and lyricists say that same thing. Do you remember the circumstances when that happened, what you were doing? Um, well, I, was, I wrote it down, so it must have been at a time when I was pretending to write. <laughs> um, more than that, I can't, you know, I can't remember whether it sort of came in between other, other uh, throw-outable, eminently ditchable uh, efforts, uh, or whether it, it was on its own. But certainly, I think... I mean, I, I, I would say that I, it was interesting. I wrote this book largely when my parents uh, were dying. And, um, and I was interested to discover that in the time when he wrote Notes from Underground, uh, Dostoevsky lost his brother and his wife in the six months in which he wrote that. He lost his brother and his wife to tuberculosis. Um, and, and he was very close to his brother, and they published a magazine together. And, and, and I feel as though there was some way, I mean, partly, I mean, I have a terrible memory anyway, but partly there's a whole, you know, some long stretches of my life that are somewhat blurry because my attention was on other things, and I can tell you a lot about the hospital rooms, but I can't tell you about much else. Um, but, but I think there's the, that the intensity of the emotion is, is, is transferred emotion from other things, I think. And it sort of kept me even though she was fairly, you know, uh, emotional, it kept me sane to write about her. Yeah. I don't know if that answers the question. But. It's a very complicated character. She's fascinating in a lot of ways. We were all, as a writer, as a group, fascinated by her. Oh, well, my hope, thank you. My hope, my hope would, it, it's interesting because I feel people have much, uh, have quite strong, reactions to her often, and, and I was saying to Adam that, that before the book had even come out, there was a sort of publisher's thing where there, there, there were booksellers and, and people from the publishing house, and, and a woman came up to me and said, Nora is me. That is me. Um, I'm so glad you wrote this book. Thank you. And then, and then sort of 15 minutes later, there was a woman who came up and said, why did you write this book? This woman is so ghastly. She's awful. She's such a whiner. <laughs> who, who, would, who, would ever read, who would ever read this? I mean... I, I'm, I'm a feminist. I don't, I don't want to read this, and I certainly don't want to give it to my daughter to read, she said. And I felt like saying, um, excuse me, you should meet that lady. <laughs> you guys need to talk. But, but, but I didn't. I didn't blow the cover of lady number one. But, 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 that's, but my, my, hope would be, my hope would be that, that it's not about what you think about her. I, I would, my hope would be that, that, um, that you believe in her, even if you hate her or she drives you nuts. That would be my hope, so thank you. Well, thank you, Claire. Um, I'll let any other books for sale here. Maggie's back there with the petition. There's food, drinks. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.